make sure that we're putting ourselves in the best position for success. And that's going to be different for different people, but we need to make sure that we're putting ourselves in the best decision for success because in business and in life, it's just a string of decisions. We live our life decision to decision. And with businesses, we have to make the best decisions possible. And it's not always clear what it is that is the right move in this instant. But the only thing that you need to do, the only responsibility you have is make the move that puts yourself in the best position for success. Hello, fabulous person, Beata Shalet here, the growth architect. Welcome back to the Business Growth Architect Show, where we bring you cutting edge business strategies from some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs, business transformation experts, and visionaries who want to help you to scale your impact. Look for one tangible strategy that you can take back and implement right away. And now back to our guest. Hello and welcome back to the Business Growth Architect. I'm your host, Beat Chalette. Today, we are talking about strategy around negotiation. My guest on the show today is Kwame Christian. Kwame, welcome to the show. Tell everybody what do they need to know about you? Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So my name is Kwame Christian. I'm the managing director and founder of the American Negotiation Institute, where we conduct negotiation and conflict management trainings and consulting that make your difficult conversations easier. Um, I'm also the host of the top ranked negotiation podcast in the world, Negotiate Anything. We have 5 million downloads, listeners in 180 different countries. So we're just growing in impact and um, growing as a company day by day. So it's been really exciting to, to see my baby grow up <laughs> before my eyes. I love that. And um, you say something very interesting about negotiation. And I want to really dive right in because most people don't understand the idea. I mean, they heard about strategy and they kind of get that there's a business strategy, strategy of some sort, but negotiation and strategy, how does that even connect? Yeah, I think people struggle with the concept of strategy in general, right? They, they yeah. do not have a strategy for anything. And so I, I have a six-year-old and um, I keep on pounding it into his head. I say, hey, Kai, what is a strategy? Just keeping it super simple for my. And he says, a plan that helps you win. That's really it. You have to think through it, right? That's really simple. And so for, for me with negotiation, I define it as anytime you're having a conversation with somebody and somebody in the conversation wants something. And so with that broad definition, you realize that you're negotiating all the time. It's not just those big, obvious transactional negotiations that happen a few times a year, like salary negotiation, car negotiation, whatever it happens to be. It's also these everyday interactions. And so once you start to realize that everything is a negotiation, then it's, it helps you to be more intentional about the way that you interact with people. And then you can put a strategy into place. Otherwise, you're just talking <laughs> with, and you're kind of living, leaving it up to chance and fate uh, and hoping that things turn out the way that you want without being intentional about the way you approach the conversation. I really like that um, because I do believe that negotiation and having a strategy around negotiation, I mean, even getting clear what it is that you want to get out of, of any kind of conversation slash negotiation is absolutely critical. But before we go in that, I want to talk to you about, you know, you, you alluded to this already a little bit. What does strategy mean for you in your business and how do you use it? Yeah, well, we have to use it every day. And um, I think it's important to, to distinguish between strategies and tactics. So strategies, that's the overall plan that you have in place, but the tactics are the tools that you use to implement the strategy. So a lot of people are tacticians day to day. They have this toolbox and they haphazardly use the tools to try to accomplish their goals. But that's usually short-term thinking because I have a problem, I have a tool, I'm gonna fix it. But they don't think about how that plays into the overall strategy because you have to have an overall goal, then you create a strategy, which is your, your map. And then you have your, the tools that you use to, to implement the strategy. And so it has to be coordinated in that way. So for me with uh, the American Negotiation Institute, when it comes down to strategy, it, a big part of it is focus. Because focus is not just what you are paying attention to, focus is also what you are strategically choosing to ignore. And with business, you could do tons of different things, thousands, hundreds of different things every day. And the beauty about business is freedom, but freedom is more of a prison when you don't know what to do with that freedom. You have the, the paradox of choice, it's overwhelming. And so for me, I, the focusing thing that I tell my team all the time is I say, we are focusing on two main things, reach and revenue. So what are things that 
improve our reach, get us in front of more people. What are the things that improve our revenue? Everything else is noise. And so we focus on those two things. And that's why we built up the media side of our company so much. And I tell the team, even though most people from the outside looking in would look at us as a training and development firm and a consulting firm, and we are, um, I say we're a media company first because we don't get clients <laughs> unless they know who we are and what we do. And so I think really it's it, the main benefit of strategy for us is focus. We know what we need to do and what we need to ignore. That's really good. You said, what is it? Uh, it's, it's like you're going to be in, in a prison if you don't know, you know, what strategy to use. I think that's absolutely correct because then you're in that reactionary prison of uh, looking at what's coming at you and then you're dodging the balls and you're throwing a couple, you catch a few, but that's not really being in front, being in front of the train and um, adjusting it. So I have to ask you this one question, which is a little bit off scripted, but why are people so incredibly nervous and afraid to negotiate? Oh, fear. It comes down to one, one thing. It's fear. Um, that's why for my first book, Finding Confidence in Conflict, it was all about helping people overcome those psychological and emotional barriers. Because for years, and this still happens in the negotiation industry, where we're teaching people how to have these difficult conversations, and they're showing them, hey, these are the tactics you need to use. Hey, these are the strategies you need to use. But it doesn't make sense to give recipes to people who are afraid to get in the kitchen. I can tell people what to do all day and they could leave the, the trainings and read my books and everything and feel very intellectually stimulated and know what they need to do. But that doesn't mean that they're going to do it. That's the distinction. And so everybody has their own performance gap, but there's something that's different for everybody that leads them to it. So maybe you were raised in a household where speaking up was was looked down upon. You're supposed to stay in line and do what you need to do. Um, maybe you had a bad conversation in the past and it, it made things go really poorly or you saw somebody else have a bad conversation and that made you afraid. Whatever it happens to be, we have to do some introspection, figure out what that is and, and find a way through it. Because if we don't address that, the, the genesis of the fear, then we're not going to have the conversations that we need to have. I think you said something really important. I want to make sure that our listeners are really understanding and hearing this loud and clear is that a lot of times in negotiation and being strategic about negotiation, it's very clear that you know who you are and why you do things a certain way. So, you know, I myself have been you know, as a, as a woman, as an outspoken woman, I mean, gosh, has there ever been a report card that says talks too much, uh, in my life. And so your entire life, you grow up and you're being taught that speaking up and saying something is wrong. And then you're being thrown into a room, you know, and I sold my business to Bill Gates and I had done some very serious negotiation. And so now you're here and suddenly you are supposed to speak up and you've been told your entire life that you're not supposed to speak up. So, you know, there's a, a, a piece here and I really recommend you all checking him out, American Negotiation Institute, uh, to really learn about how to overcome this old programming and these fears, have the confidence, get clear about what you are looking for in a negotiation so that you guys can um, win and win more negotiations and get more of what you want or even get clear what it even is that you want to get out of a negotiation, which I bet you teach him as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, what's your favorite strategy that you are going to share with our audience today, Kwame? Ah, yeah. So um, I'm a chess nerd. I play chess more than is recommended. I, I have a, about 19, over 19,000 games logged on chess.com and I'm up to the 98th percentile. So I love playing chess. And I think there are a lot of parallels uh, from chess philosophy to life. And so the thing I, I always talk about is we need to make sure that we're putting ourselves in the best position for success. And that's going to be different for different people, but we need to make sure that we're putting ourselves in the best position for success because in business and in life, it's just a string of decisions. We will live our life decision to decision. And with businesses, we have to make the best decisions possible. And it's not always clear what it is that is the right move in this instant. But the only thing that you need to do, the only responsibility you have is make the move that puts yourself in the best position for success. So for us, like I said, we are focused 
on reach and revenue, those type of things. So if I'm not exactly sure what it is that I need to do, then I'm gonna make the decision that increases my reach and increases the revenue. Ignore everything else and focus on that. And so if you have a, a different type of business where you are focusing on, let's say you realize that the key for su to success for you is expanding existing accounts, you're not exactly sure what to do. Well, what's the move that puts me in the best position for success? I'm going to reach out to one of my old clients and set up a call just to touch base and see how they're doing, because I know that touch point could lead to more business down the road. And so I think that focusing question, what's the move that puts me in the best position for success? is the thing that is the, the simplest and easiest to understand, um, easiest part of my strategy to understand because you have to figure out what that means to you, what the best position is. And all you need to do is put yourself in that position because the game will break in your favor one way or another. Because again, bringing it back to chess, sometimes you don't know what the opportunity is gonna be. You don't see the vulnerability on the other side yet. But all you know is that if I put my pieces in the right place, and make sure I'm in a good position, I will be in the right position to take advantage of the opportunity when it presents itself. So I think that's really the, the key part of my strategy that I stick to. I love that. There's uh, two things I heard. So number one, I heard that there is, you know, in, in growth architecture, we call it setting a main focus and having that kind of rule, rule all the decision making so that you, you know, so when you say it's reach and revenue for you, then every decision that is being made is either for or against that goal, right? It's either going to sidetrack you to some some other area or it's going to lead you closer to that. So that's very specific to say what are the criteria, you know, and it could be a yearly thing that changes, you know, a focus that has that, that, that is changing, doubling your, your leads or, um, you, you know, however you want to get there. So I like that a lot that there's a very specific focus to rule all your decision making, all your strategies underneath, so that every decision brings you closer to that goal. The second piece you said, it hinted to me that there was a mindset piece. And that brings me to my next question. So does mindset play a part in how you negotiate, how you teach, how you show up in your own personal life? Mindset is everything. <laughs> <laughs> my mindset is everything you could have the skills but if you don't if you you can have the skill set but if you don't have the mindset then it's really all completely worthless you know and you have to have a different mindset for different aspects of your life you know so for me with business it's developed as the company's developed so it's not just me doing things my way now i need to have that more compassionate empathetic mindset to consider the impact of the decisions that i make on my team so we all work differently. So I have to not just have the, the pure business strategy. I also have, a, I have to have a flexible mindset that's not just driven, go, go, go all the time, but also, hey, care, care, care about the people on your team, right? And so I think with everything, you have to have the right mindset. When it comes to the uh, difficult conversations we have, I have these things, I'm, I'm gonna debut this in my next book, um, How to Have Difficult Conversations About Race, that's gonna come out. In, uh, in September, I call them helpful fictions. And so these are, these are lies that you tell yourself, but you know it's a lie, but it helps. <laughs> so, so you tell me what you think about this. So for instance, there might be a really tough negotiation coming up, a really difficult conversation, and it doesn't look like things are going my way. It, from the outside looking in, you might look at the person and say, yeah, there's no chance they're gonna give you what you want or, or take you seriously or whatever it happens to be. So an example of a helpful fiction is, I believe that I can connect with anyone and I believe that if I'm in a deal I can get it done that's it you know so it helps me to clear out the noise and focus on controlling the controllables what is within my control let me focus on that and get it done and then I believe that if I do that things will things will break my way is that always true absolutely not but it's a choice to believe it because it leads to the proper behaviors to get the outcome that I want to have if it is there and um, that feeds into the other one where um, I believe negotiation isn't the art of deal making, it's the art of deal discover, discovery. So you and I are having a conversation to discover whether or not there is a deal to be made. If there is one, great, let's get it. If there isn't one, great, we tried our best. But I'm going to try to learn more in the process and at least build a solid working relationship in the process. And I can get value in that way. But I think if you have all the skills in the world, you have all the strategies in the world, but you don't have the right mindset, it's really all worthless.
That's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you on that. I see this all the time. And, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm not 20. So I've been doing this for a while. And it's always amazing to me when I see that there is the objective of the deal that comes before everything else. My dad told me this, and I've said this on the show many times, is at the end of the day, before you go to bed, you look in the mirror, you need to like the person looking back at you. And so that's, I think, a great philosophy on how to negotiate or how to show up or how to build relationships, because you may negotiate a great deal once, and then they hate you so much that you'll never negotiate another deal with that person, that group, and everybody they know. It's a funny story. I had this once where I went into a car dealership and I, you know, and it was the classic, you know, sleazy guy with a woman situation it was, was years and years and years ago. And then I said, please don't do this thing where you leave me here and let me sit for 45 minutes while you go off and have lunch. And sure enough, he did that. And then when he came back, I got up and I said, not just will I never buy a car here. I'll make sure that everybody knows what happens here. So all of my friends also will never come and buy a car here because the experience was so bad. So I think we need to, when it comes to negotiation, be very clear. Um, somebody who is unhappy will tell at least nine people. So you want to make sure that negotiations are done in a way that you can walk away, even if you don't get the deal, but you still look like a like an okay, decent person I want to talk to, talk to afterward. So Kwame, what is it about for you? So you, you've been having amazing success. You're touching some sensitive issues that other people go, oh, you're doing what? You're publishing a book about what race? Um, what is it for you about power, empowerment, money, impact? Where are you at? Yeah, it's just impact. It's just impact. And like I said, we, we define negotiation very broadly. Anytime you're having a conversation and somebody in the conversation wants something. And so we want to go where the most difficult conversations are happening. And in, in America at the moment, it was difficult conversations about race. And so there isn't a book where there's like a negotiation expert, a communication expert walking people through how to have these conversations in a way that are in, in ways that are constructive versus destructive. And we wanted to come in and be that voice. And it's a serious reputational risk taking on a controversial topic because it's easier. It, it's much easier for me to just talk about money, helping big companies make more money, negotiate the, those deals. But like comparatively, even if we're negotiating a like a you know five hundred million dollar deal like we've done before, those conversations are not as touchy as the conversations about race. And so they're definitely challenging, they're intellectually stimulating, but they're not dangerous in that way, you know? And so we wanna be able to provide people with the resources they need to talk about the things that they wanna talk about. And it, it's really all about impact. So who knows, maybe we come back next year and then I'm like, I was wrong, this was a bad strategy, I shouldn't have done it, <laughs> but, I, but I doubt it. You know, it's just, it's just all about the impact and we wanna to touch as many people as we can uh, with the message that we have. I, I think it's a and it's a probably one of the most important conversations to have. My my first husband uh, was black. My daughter is is a mixie, and so for me, you know, as I've been looking at this for years and years and years, um, I I always wondered um, because there's so many sensitivities on both sides, right? What can I say? What can I not say? What is inappropriate? Can I can I come from that? And I think that we've seen an oversensitivity sensitization if the word if there's such a word uh of 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 america where it's in cancel culture everybody's just waiting for you to say one word that i can take out of context and then just destroy your life destroy your career destroy everything you 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 worked for so i i i mean you know, count me in. I'll, I'll be making sure we're promoting this any way we can possibly can, because I do believe it's a it's it's one of the most important things that people need to learn that people that are not like you or that don't look like you, that there is a cultural style, there is a different experience. But at the end of the day, we're all people. And so if I if I understand that I can, as a white woman, get along with other white people who are all different than me, then why would I not be able to get along with people of different races and cultures if I keep the thought in mind, oh, they're 
just different than me and everybody's different than me. So I hope I, uh, did I oversimplify this? Did I say something that needs to be corrected? No, you're spot on. You are, you're spot on. And I I think it comes back to our motto at A&I. We say the best things in life are on the other side of difficult conversations. And when you think about your life, most likely, if you look at the most impactful moments, there's probably a difficult conversation somewhere in the vicinity, you know? And so I think people are really missing out on opportunities to connect and learn and create new relationships because of that fear, because they're afraid of being canceled, because they're afraid of offending people. But what they don't realize is that, you know, bringing it full circle here, there is a strategy, a skill set, and a mindset that you can put in place that can help you to avoid those conversations and engage wholeheartedly without the fear of uh, reprisal. So that's that's what we're trying to do with with this new endeavor. I love it. I, I, I love, 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 love it. Because to me, um, you know, and, 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 and I've been, you know, there's been a se- several cancel attempts of, 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 of myself, you know, as an outspoken, angry feminist cat lady, um, <laughs> that, that, you know, you, you suddenly stand in the middle of a firestorm and you don't even know exactly what ignited it other than you just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And somebody found out about it and then had a bad moment and then unleashes their, their anger, their anger on you. I'm, I want to ask you this, just because we are in such charged times, what advice would you have for our listeners that say, man, I feel the best thing is to just put my head down, be quiet, not say anything. How do we get people back to be more courageous in their conversations? So it's two things. Uh, Number one, it's getting them to realize that there is value in having the conversation so that you have to see the value. Um, The next thing is giving just a very simple framework that you could use called the compassionate curiosity framework. So first, let's talk about what it takes. Like, How do we get over that fear? A simple way. Um, We want to shift our fear. It's okay to be afraid. You just have to be afraid of the right thing. And so we have to shift from the fear of failure to the fear of regret. Because we always think about what things look like when we fail. And we think about those horrible things. But we don't think about how we will feel after we have not tried. And so you have to think five years, 10 years into the future, if I look back on my behavior right now and I look back on my decision not to engage in this conversation, not to advocate for myself and ask for what I want, if I look back on my behavior and I regret it, then that's probably a sign that you should have stepped up. Because we only have one chance in this moment to have the conversation. We can't always assume that it's going to be there in the future. And so we have to say, hey, I'm not not just doing it for what I'm doing right now what I'm here to accomplish right now. I'm doing it for the, for the the version of myself five or 10 years in the future, because I want to be able to look back and respect the decision that I made. And so win, lose, or draw, I'm going to take this shot because that's the move that the future version of myself would respect. And then when it comes to actually navigating the conversation, the compassion and curiosity framework is really simple. And I, I debuted it in my, uh, my TED talk finding confidence in conflict, and then went deeper in it in my book with the same name. So it's step one, acknowledge and validate emotions. Step two, get curious with compassion. And step three, joint problem solving. And it's not a rigid framework. You can use it in any conversation. I use it in my legal negotiations, my business negotiations, um, my negotiations (laughs) with my wife and with my six-year-old to try to get him to get in bed and stay in bed. And um, it's designed to be versatile and used in any situation. So that is a tool that you could use and know that you have that as your North Star to guide what you do and what you say in the conversations. Yes, and uh, I, I, I have a, a suspicion that a lot of it is about asking questions and have a, a healthy curiosity versus making assumption. Just, just guessing here. Exactly. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what it's always about, right? You can't ask somebody, hey, what do you think? And then the minute they tell you what to think, what, what they think, you go like, that cannot possibly be true. And you go like, well, why, why'd you ask him the question in the first place then? If you don't want to hear the answer and then um, make sure that you listen to the answer and take that as face value, because I think that's probably one of the biggest things I see in my world, in my business consulting, when I work with my clients one-on-one, that then when they do ask the questions, that they then hear the answer and it's so beyond what they can imagine that they don't believe the answer, even though they asked the question and they got the answer, but then they don't believe the answer, believe the answer. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Again, 
going back to the mindset. You can do the right things. You can ask the right questions. You can ask them in the right way. But if you have the wrong mindset in place, it, it's really worth it. Yes, yes. And so I, I encourage everybody who's listening to this to, you know, really come at this from this curiosity, which which we use in business growth architecture all the time, that if you come at things from a curious perspective to say, I wonder where this is going, I wonder what this is about, I wonder what he's, he or she is thinking, I wonder uh, how far I can push it, it takes all the edge out versus the assumption of, 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 of making assumption on things you don't even know, which is your stuff. Most of the time, it's not even real or something that's on the table. Kwame, this has been unreal. Uh, so good. I love it. So how can we find out about you? How do we, uh, how do we get our hands on the TED Talk and the uh, compassionate, uh, curious conversation? Tell us everything. Yeah, so um, best way to check us out is to go to our website, AmericanNegotiationInstitute.com. And then um, if you're interested in uh, working with us, consulting or getting a training, there's a, there's a, you know, through the contact form, you can get in touch with us there. Our podcast, we have multiple podcasts. So we have the uh, first, the flagship show, Negotiate Anything, five days a week. Um, that's coming out all the time. And then we have uh, over 450 episodes now. So we've been around for a while. <laughs> Um, and then we have uh, the Ask with Confidence podcast. It's all about women in negotiation hosted by Maria Eaton, who's our head of content and marketing. And then we have a Spanish language podcast as well called Negociación Desde Cero. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always posting things on LinkedIn. Um, and, um, you know, on Instagram, the only reason people follow me at this point is to see my cute kids. And I, <laughs> I have accepted that too. So um, Kwame negotiates on Instagram. That's my handle. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll add all of that in the show notes so everybody can find you and follow you. This has been amazing. You've been an incredible guest. I hope we get to do this again. Um, just really great stuff. And so thank you so much for being on our show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And that's it for us today. Thank you for listening and watching the Business Growth Architect Show. I enjoyed having you here. And for accountability, just take one of the strategies that you have heard, one thing that you can implement in your business immediately. Please leave comments. Don't forget to like and share this show. And if you have any questions about business, please put them in the comments. We are here for you. We're here to support you and help you to grow, build and scale your own business. For more advice, please check out our website in the show notes below. Thank you again. This is Beat.